two dimensional rendering spaces. That's okay. Yeah, so this is great that, that there's actually a live audience. And hello, everybody out there in, uh, <laughs> in Cyberland. So um, the other reason that it gave my wife and I a chance to, to come to Saskatoon was I was intrigued by the multidisciplinarity of, of your club, the intersection between science, research, and society. And so that intersection will be the focus of my talk, even though I even though my academic background is in the science of uh, paleoclimate, I'm gonna spend not too much time on that because I wanna take advantage of the theme, but also there's another reason. <clears throat> if you wanna know about the science of drought, you don't have to import somebody from Regina. <laughs> Pretty much all of the Canadian experts on drought are within five to 10 minutes of, of here at uh, Environment Climate Change Canada and Saskatchewan Research Council uh, in Innovation Place and of course on the U of S campus. Uh, in fact, you don't have to go five to 10 minutes. You can go one, two, three, four rows into the audience to Dr. Barry Bonsell, probably the person that's published most about prairie drought amongst anybody. And I'm not saying that just because Barry's here, but um, I wanna emphasize that I'm trying to capture the intersection. And in particular, how society perceives drought and how we perceive the likelihood of a drought. So we're focusing on the drought of 2021 that hopefully is over. Um, and there was lots of media coverage because it was a severe event. It had devastating consequences for the ag sector. So there was lots of media coverage including this article in the Star Phoenix towards the end of last year, where they quote this farmer, this ag producer who farms near Davidson, and he said, we're in unknown territory. Um, I've never seen a drought like this, at least in, in my area. And the journalist went on to say that this was a generational drought. Now, I appreciate this particular passage for a few reasons. First of all, the farmer indicated where he farms. He also used the term I. I have never seen something this bad. And so you know the perspective from, from which he's speaking. And also by saying I and giving his age, you know his perspective in terms of longevity. Because really, how you perceive drought depends to a large extent on how old you are. I mean, ask somebody, there aren't too many around, but ask somebody who's in their 90s, who lived through the 1930s, and you get a much different story than somebody like, I suppose he would be an older millennium, millennial, 44, an older millennial, not a baby boomer like the rest of us. So depending on your generation, you have a different perception of drought. Here you can see a depiction of the drought, at least, late summer um, of last year. Actually, no, this is a different map than I was going to use originally. And I had lots of choice because this is from this fantastic website that's maintained by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the group led by Trevor Hadwin, where they update, I think it's weekly, or it used to be daily, I think it's every what, every two weeks or every week. They 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 provide a different set of agroclimatic maps. And so here is precipitation between April and September. So basically last spring and summer across the prairie provinces, given as a percentage of the average or normal precipitation. And anything green is more or less average. Uh, all the other shades represent a deficit of precipitation. And the darker the shade, the greater the deficit. So that area in dark, the darker brown, the brown area, about 40 to 60% of normal precipitation. So about half the precipitation that we normally get during the spring and summer. I said I appreciate the perspective of this particular farmer because it's human nature that we tend to exaggerate 
current events. In fact, psychologists have a name for it. It's called the recency bias. And it seems perfectly natural because the human mind is focused on the here and now. And so we tend to have a bias towards events that are currently happening or recently happening. And I'll give you some other examples. And this is not, whoop, it was working. It's okay, I'll just, I'll just hit, this, hit the space bar. We had it working. Yep, there we go. So this is the other end of the hydrochromatic spectrum. This is too much water. This is excess water, which you had fairly recently in the early part, it early to mid part of the 2010s. There was lots of water, especially in Eastern Saskatchewan. And this is Highway 6 going up the Melfort. And we had to stop because the Quill Lakes, the water was lapping over, over the highway. And when I got home, the next day in the Regina paper, I saw this quote from a landowner who said, how do you plan for something that's never happened? Really, this is this has really never happened. Now I cut this person a lot of slack because they're owning land that's underwater. They're probably traumatized. What's more problematic is when authorities use this kind of language when our political leadership uses kind of language, and they do. So what did the premier say? It was unprecedented. And of course, if you look up unprecedented, it means it's never happened before. Now, so you don't get the sense that I'm being politically partisan, I'm gonna choose another politician. Of course, Devine was a conservative. Currently, British Columbia is governed by an NDP government. And their deputy minister, their deputy premier said that this was an unprecedented weather event that nobody expected referring to the floods in British Columbia last fall. Really? I can show you reports from BC government scientists that predicted this event. Now what's problematic about this is it's a means of shirking your responsibility. If you're responsible for preventing damage, if you're responsible for compensating people for the damage, then there's a tendency to refer to these things as acts of God that couldn't have been prevented. Well, let's come back to drought. And the drought we just had in 2021 is often compared to the drought of 1988 and the drought of 2002. Now, if you're a millennial, or if you're a student and you're what's it called, a Gen Z, or if, if you're a young student, you probably don't remember these droughts, but us baby boomers remember them well. Well, not that well, our minds are kind of fading. I had to go back and read newspapers to get a sense of how bad they really were. So there's a picture I took in 1988, uh, shortly after we had moved to Saskatchewan, and I thought, boy, Saskatchewan's a dry place. Well, we moved uh, in the 80s when there was a couple really dry years. But then 2002, I took this picture uh, leaving Saskatoon, heading towards Lloydminster, and there was a dust storm. You can see that the, the sky is kind of obscured and there was dirt drifting across the highway and up against the fence. You don't see this anymore or so much. It was a little bit last summer, but of course, Farmers are much less likely to leave their land fallow. There's been a revolution in farming practices whereby land is tilled much, much less and there's more continuous cropping. So the rate of erosion has been controlled such that droughts no longer produce the incredible dust storms that we saw in the 1930s and 1980s. But even so, it was a really dry year. And what was somewhat unique about the drought, of, about that drought, it was the second year of severe drought. So back to back years. And there was a fantastic study led by Elaine Wheaton, who also lives in Saskatoon. Well, on an acreage next to Saskatoon. And her colleagues um, did a report for Agriculture Canada where they documented the cost of the drought of 2001 
2002. It was in the billions. And here's a quote from the Globe and Mail that described it as downright ugly. And then they presented some stats from Statistics Canada about the extent of agricultural land uh, where the wheat had withered. So, you know, these, these are relatively recent droughts. And I just wanna give you a, a short primer. Uh, when people ask Barry and I about drought, we always have to say, well, what kind of drought are you talking about? Because, I mean, people know instinctively that drought is a shortage of water relative to demand. But when, you, when it comes to quantifying drought, when it comes to studying drought, you have to carefully define what you mean by drought and how you're measuring it. Is it a shortage of soil moisture or precipitation? Is it a shortage of lake water or river water? Well, depending on the type of water and the use of the water, we classify drought in this way, where the most immediate type of drought is just the shortage of precipitation and the loss of water by evaporation. So a combination of high temperature and a lack of precipitation fairly quickly within weeks in most places produces what we consider to be drought conditions. But eventually, and not too much later, a lack of precipitation and a lot of evaporation results in a lack of soil moisture, which of course has agricultural consequences. And then if the drought persists, the lakes and rivers and wetlands and aquatic ecosystems begin to suffer. And we consider that to be hydrological drought. And these droughts eventually have socioeconomic consequences, initially for the ag sector, but eventually for everybody. Eventually people in the city discover there's a drought when you start to ask them to ration their car watering and their lawn watering. Um, so the socioeconomic drought is measured not in terms of water, but in terms of the impacts, the economic and social impacts. Well, I'm gonna talk mainly about agricultural drought and hydrological drought. Um, starting with hydrological drought, because we have pretty good records, in fact, we have really good records of fluctuations in stream flow, lake levels, courtesy of the Water Survey of Canada. We have records going back to the 19 teens. So we have a record of hydrological drought. And across the bottom, there is a precipitation record for Indian Head, Saskatchewan, going back to 1937. And on the top is spring wheat yield each year at Indian Head back over the same period of time. And of course, not surprisingly, years in which there is a drop in wheat yield are the years in which there's a lack of precipitation. But I also wanna point out something else. Look how wheat yield has been going up, especially since the 1980s. I mean, <laughs> this is the RM of Indian Head, the entire RM. Um, I'm sure a lot of that is just farming practices, improved technology, improving practices, but it corresponds exactly to the warming of our climate. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. So this is an indication of the impact of hydrological drought, sorry. Agricultural drought, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, this is agricultural drought because the parameter is precipitation. It impacts soil moisture, which impacts crop yield. Now let's get to hydrological drought. And here's a depiction of the hydrological cycle with precipitation and water loss by evaporation and the transpiration by plants. I wanna point out these things. Trees are part of the hydrological cycle. And so they actually record hydrological drought. So for most of my career, every summer, I've been dragging students into the forest and collecting wood because trees need water. And the amount of tree growth is proportional to the amount of water which was available to the tree. So we've collected wood at every one of these locations. <clears throat> 
we made forays up into the territories, but mostly we have circumscribed the prairie ecozone. I mean, there's no trees in this area or no old trees. Uh, although there's a few exceptions we found in the Kalpau Valley, some old oak trees, and this is the Cypress Hills. But pretty much we have to go to the margins of the prairie, especially in the foothills and Rockies to collect old wood. And here's a few scenes of 30 years of field work. On the upper left, this is a thousand year old limber pine near Calgary. On the upper right are some old oak trees in southeastern Saskatchewan and just over the border in North Dakota, 300 year old oak trees. On the bottom right is some very old wood, more than a thousand years old, that's sitting on rock. And so it, is, it has survived uh, centuries since the tree died. And we, it's easy to collect that wood, you just grab a chainsaw. If the tree's alive, we use an instrument called an increment bore that collects a sample about the size of a pencil and doesn't affect the tree. And the other source of dead wood is buildings like this. This is near the Cypress Hills, lots of corrals and cabins and barns built from old trees taken from the Cypress Hills. And here's one of our samples of dead wood. Bring it back to the lab. We carefully cut it, polish it, sand it. The tree rings are exposed. We cross state the wood. We take thousands of samples and compare the tree rings. And we were able to determine that this particular piece of wood came from a tree that was a seedling in the year 542. So we have more than 1,500 years of tree rings and the size of every ring is proportional to the water which was available that year. In fact, a tree ring has two parts. It's not so evident here in this pine, it shows up better in spruce and, and fir, but there are two parts to the tree ring. There's the early wood, which grows when there's good soil moisture. And then there's the late wood that grows later in the growing season when the soil moisture is begins to decline. So we actually have subannual data on the growth of the tree. So that's why we're able to, oh, and here's in the lab. And I should have pointed out, I've got a co-presenter. I added, maybe you didn't notice, but I added Sheena to this presentation because as I created the presentation, I kept asking Sheena for information. Eventually I said, Sheena, I'm gonna add you as a presenter. You, you're providing so much data. So Sheena works in our tree ring lab. And what we do is here's some of the samples. There's some dead wood, there's some cores from living trees. We scan them on this industrial scanner, produce a very large high resolution image. It's gigabytes in size. And then we use image analysis software that's built for tree rings to analyze. And this is zoomed in many, many times. We analyze the growth of the tree. That's how we're able to determine how much water has been in the South Saskatchewan River, right? It's right there, a few blocks here. <laughs> this is how much water has been in the river every year back to the year 888. Now I give entire talks, I give one hour lectures on this one slide, but so please restrain me because <laughs> <laughs> it's taken decades to produce and it's a ton of information, but the way, the way it's plotted is a wet year is blue and a dry year is red. So the droughts are in red. And here are the droughts of, the, of 2001, 2002, the 1980s, the 1930s. We don't need the trees to tell us that those were dry years. But the point is that the trees predict the droughts that we know. And therefore we expect the trees to be able to predict the, tree, the droughts we don't know. So there is a mathematical relationship between recorded water levels and tree rings. We develop a statistical model that we apply to all the rings that predate the gauges and go back to 888. Now I'm not gonna talk about these droughts that lasted a century. Um, it's too depressing to think that that can happen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like here, um, well, we're not gonna go there. Let's, let's talk about these droughts because they're relatively recent. 
And obviously there were people here, well, they were obviously indigenous people. And in their oral histories, they talk about times in which there was no water and the beaver populations were decimated and the water was bad. Um, and so, but there's both indigenous oral history and European records from this time. I want to point out these decades, the 1900s and 1910s, when there was a period of relatively abundant water. But just prior to that, in the mid to later 1800s, it was a long period in which most years were dry. And then look at the 1700s, just a whole lot of drought in the 1700s. Well, let's say what, let's find out what Europeans were doing at the time. Well, first, let's work backwards. So let's start with the 1910s. That's when the Europeans pretty much came to the prairies. <clears throat> I saw where the population of Saskatchewan went from 60,000 in 1900 to a million in the 1920s. And it's still a million. <laughs> okay. And this is uh, my grandfather, Disky in the Prairie Sod. He came in 1914. So did my other grandfather, but he was a coal miner. Um, so yeah, the government was, was promoting the prairies as a place to come and the government lucked out. It coincided with a couple of years of decent water. But just prior to that, there was a long drought. And in the very first edition of the Medicine Hat Times, they said it was criminal to bring settlers here. Well, the ranchers knew, and of course the indigenous people knew that there had been decades of drought and the climate flipped for reasons that Barry can explain. And in the 1850s, the colonial government sent an expedition to the prairies to determine whether it should be settled. And Captain John Palliser said, no. He said, the region, region will be comparatively useless forever. And of course the government ignored the scientists' advice and, and sent Europeans, but John Palliser came through during that period of prolonged drought. And then going back even further, we saw that there were a lot of dry years in the 1700s. Well, we have geological evidence that the Great Sand Hills in southwestern Saskatchewan, today they're covered in grass, most of them. Back then, most of the sand dunes were moving. And we have from the journals of the Hudson Bay Company, this is a remarkable statement that in the 1790s, they couldn't move the firs. There was no water in the river. They were talking about the North Saskatchewan River, which today there's a city of a million people, Edmonton, and the city of Prince Albert that are sitting on this river. And apparently it nearly dried up in the 1790s. Now, historically, I mean, people like history, so it's a nice story, but the scientific message is these kinds of droughts will reoccur. But when they do, it'll be in a warmer climate and it'll be a much larger population. So you can imagine that if we have a drought that's a decade or two in length, but occurs in a warmer climate, what kind of devastation it will, it will have for the, the economy of the, of the prairie provinces. A warmer climate, here's the best evidence we have that the climate is warming. This is the temperature of the whole world every month back to January of 1880 and right up to the beginning of this year, January. And, the, and, and it's an anomaly map. So a positive anomaly is red, a negative anomaly is blue. And it shows that every single month since the late 1970s, with one tiny exception, December 1984 apparently was a cold month, but every other month since the late 1970s has been warmer than average. That's why we call it global warming because the strongest signal is at a global scale. Well, let's come back, let's come down to Canada. And this is of a report that, that Barry co-authored and some other government scientists from 2019 showing how much Canada has warmed since 1948. The thing to note is the darker the shade, the greater the warming. There's been much more warming in uh, Western Canada and especially Northwestern Canada. Oh, that's weird. Oh, and Merle, you're back there. Yeah, and especially in winter. So let's look at Saskatoon. 
in winter. This is the daily minimum winter temperature. This is the lowest temperature every day, averaged over the winter back to 1900 and right up to the winter we just had. So the winter we just had, it's relatively cold if you're a millennial. If you're a baby boomer, nah, it wasn't that cold. <laughs> right? If you follow the, the linear trend, the minimum daily temperature has increased from less than minus 22 to almost minus 18. That's more than four degrees, which is actually a huge increase in minimum temperature. To put that in perspective, about 100,000 years ago, the temperature of the world changed by four degrees. It took thousands of years. And a glacier formed that covered all of Canada. <laughs> it was in the other direction, but it was only about four degrees was enough to create the largest glacier that's ever existed as far as we can tell. So, or another way to think about it is to choose these thresholds. So let's define a warm winter as a minimum temperature above minus 16. Well, there's been a bunch of warm winters since 1980. Before 1980, there was two. One of them was 1931, which is the warmest winter we've ever had because it was a very strong El Nino. What about cold winters? Well, let's define anything colder than minus 24 as a cold winter. If you count those, there was a dozen cold winters until 1980. There's been none since then, if you use that definition of a cold winter. Okay, so we say that Western Canada is getting warmer by getting much less cold. But that's only one type of climate change. What I showed you was the first bullet, a change in the average conditions. That was mean annual when daily mean, mean daily winter minimum temperature, a change in the average. But there's also changes in the amount of short-term variability from season to season and year to year. And then there's a shift in the intensity and the probability of extreme events, which brings us back to drought. And we found a good way to show it is using these probability distributions. So people in our lab, took precipitation data for the prairies for the summer from climate models. We have no data for the future. So we took this from climate models. We looked at the probability of precipitation and fit it with a bell curve. And what you see is as you go from the past into the future, the curve shifts to the right by a small amount, which means an increase in the average precipitation. But this is summer, it's gonna be offset by much higher temperatures. So in fact, if you look at a drought index, it's actually getting drier, even though there's more precipitation. But I think the more interesting fact here is look at the shape of the curve. The peak is falling. So the mean is getting less likely. Well, to begin with, average is a very strange concept in Saskatchewan. And the average is getting even less common. What's becoming more common are the extremes. The curve is being stretched. And so high amounts of precipitation and low amounts of precipitation become more likely as our climate warms. A few years ago, this thing failed me again. Well, sorry, that's because I was picking up that. Aha, uh -huh. okay, if you want to advance. Okay. <laughs> I gave a talk um, in Swift Current. This is 2015, April. It was a warmer and drier April than this one. It was so warm and dry, there were prairie fires. And I was coming home from Swift and I got near Mortlac and I saw smoke on the horizon. And I was way too curious, so I pulled off, and sure enough, there was a, there was a prairie fire in April, which you wouldn't necessarily expect, except in a very dry spring 
And then I thought about a talk I gave in Tabor, Alberta a few years ago. And afterwards, one of the irrigation district managers came up to me and said, Dave, nice talk, but I'll believe in climate change when we get unexpected weather. Wow. I said, can I coach you on that? Because that's the perfect definition of climate change. Climate change is weather we don't expect. Again and again and again and again, not once. But if we keep getting unexpected weather, something's going on. That distribution of precipitation is changing. If we're getting weather that's unusually wet or unusually dry. Like, no better example than last summer. This brings us back to the drought last year. That incredible heat dome, which was hottest in BC, but of course that system moved to the east. And so we had some unusually high temperatures, not like these, almost 50 degrees at Lytton, BC. I Googled that and I found out that that's higher than any temperature ever recorded in Europe or South America. Those two continents have never reached 50 degrees. We almost did. And this shattered the previous Canadian record by four degrees. At, wanna advance it? At poor old yellow grass <laughs> near Regina. They gotta take their sign down. They're no longer the Canadian hotspot. Well, of course, this heat dome triggered fire and drought, but it also triggered a bunch of scientific inquiry. And some of Barry's colleagues did this study where they determined that this heat was virtually impossible without human caused climate change. This is called an attribution study. How much can you attribute extreme values to climate change? And they have a various rigorous methodology where they run models without human influence and with human influence, and they can produce these temperatures only with the human influence. And this is part of the reason we had a hot summer, but we also, and you can see the consequences. This is uh, getting into now socioeconomic drought, and this is the decline in canola yield and spring wheat yield in the prairie provinces. And here's that, I showed you spring wheat yield for Indian head back in the 1930s. This is spring wheat yield for all of Saskatchewan right back to 1908. And you can see the impact of drought, it's pretty clear. Um, whoops. 1937, 1961, 1988, 2002, and thank you, 2021. Look at the sharp decline in wheat yield last summer. At the same time, average wheat yield has been on this fairly steep upward climb that we attribute in part to a more favorable climate when there's no drought. So let's hope that this summer, this growing season is one of those years because man, if you've looked at the price of inputs and nitrogen fertilizer, it's just crazy. Although commodity prices are also high. So if we get some spring rain, some early summer rain, and with the snowpack that we had, maybe, maybe it'll be a decent year. You know, at the end of, uh, well, mid-November, we got our first big snowfall in the Regina area. And CBC called and said, is this gonna end the drought? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't think so. This, you know, it's one snowfall and, and it was really super windy. And you know what happens? Most of the water ends up in the ditch, right? So all that snow ended up behind shelter belts and in ditches and, so I thought, I don't think this is gonna end the drought. And then, you know, what happened? It kept snowing and snowing and snowing. I wish they had called me at the end of the winter instead of the beginning. <laughs> yeah, but we had a really decent snowpack. Why? Because of 
La Nina. So this is a record of sea surface temperature in the equatorial Pacific. Uh, red is El Nino's. We nearly always, and this was I think Barry's PhD thesis from the 1990s. <laughs> People are discovering El Nino La Nina. Barry was writing about it in his youth. <laughs> so um, these were dry years. And nearly always a La Nina. Well, look at this. The most recent strong La Nina was 2010, 2011. And think about all the flooding that occurred in southeastern Saskatchewan and southern Manitoba. So we can have La Nina to thank for this snowpack. And as a result, things have been improving. Uh, this is a, a few days ago. I pulled down a map a few days ago, and that green area. That green area of average precipitation is much larger now, much of Saskatchewan. But even so, drought persists in this area, which is yellow and red. And this happens to be the driest part of the prairies, right? South of the Cypress Hills, north of the Cypress Hills, Great Sand Hills. This is the special areas, special areas in Alberta. They're called special because there aren't enough people to form a government. <laughs> No, it's true, the province, the province governs that area. It was heavily populated in the 1914s, including my grandfather. <laughs> and they left in the 1920s and 30s. Why? Well, this is the area that gets the most frequent and severe drought. Sure enough, that's the case right now. But at least a big chunk of the prairies has decent moisture. And like I said, it's not gonna last and we get, until we get some precipitation in spring and summer. But here's another view of, of the drought of 2021. This is all of North America. So we've been looking at the prairies, but as of September, look at the large area that was under severe and extreme drought. Now, during the winter, the West Coast got a whole lot of rain. You may have heard about the flooding in Oregon and California and so on. So a lot of the drought was alleviated along the coast, but not on the Southern Plains. This is unusual. Let's look at the drought of 1988 and the drought of 2001, at least from the US side of the border. We know, I've already shown you that there was drought in Canada in these years, but check out how in the US, the drought was only in the Northern Plains states. And in the Southern Plains, it was either no drought or in fact, excess water. This is typical under natural conditions. There is this dipole, this dipole where if it's dry on the prairies, it's wet in the American Southwest and vice versa. That's not happening now. And this is probably one of the strongest indications that climate change is part of this drought. And I expect, and this is just a hypothesis, but I expect that right now Barry's colleagues are studying this because I'm sure there will be an attribution study done on the drought of 2021. And I'm sure they're gonna look at the extent of this drought because it's unusually widespread. It's not typical of what we consider to be natural climate variability. And of course, scientists know this, and this is, I guess, the most reputable body of scientists, thousands of scientists that comprise the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They release a report every five to seven years, and they just released their most recent report in three volumes. Volume three just came out a few weeks ago. Volume one came out last summer, and that's the physical basis and they came out and said that it's unequivocal that we've changed the climate and that the observed warming cannot be explained by human factors. This is as close as you can possibly get to uncertainty among scientists. Scientists can never say anything with certainty because there's always a small possibility, tiny, tiny possibility that they could be wrong. That's what separates science from belief. If you believe in something, you have 100% confidence. 
But scientists always have this tiny, tiny nagging probability that they could be wrong, but this is as close as they possibly get to certainty, to use language like unequivocal. And they go on to say that they can attribute um, <clears throat> hot extremes and, uh, whoops, they can attribute, come on, there we go. Anyway, look at the very last sentence. They can attribute warming over land and an increase in evaporation and an increase in the severity of droughts with high confidence to global warming. So scientists with the possible exception of a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction who would just like to be contrary, which is great, um, are pretty certain, well, they're nearly absolutely certain the climate is warming and they're fairly certain that it's causing an increase in both drought and excess water. This is in contrast to the rest of the population of the Prairie Provinces. This is some research done uh, by the University of Montreal where they've been polling people in Canada and asking them questions like, is the earth getting warmer? Well, the average response in Canada is 83% of people think that the climate is getting warmer. In Alberta and much of Saskatchewan, it's closer to 50%. In BC and Quebec, it's like 80 to 90%. So we are an anomaly, we're anomalous. Canada's a donut when it comes to attitudes and understanding of climate change. Now, some scientists react by saying that it's because these people don't understand. I don't believe that. In fact, I get kind of, this doesn't, people say, doesn't this bother you? What bothers me is when scientists condemn people on the prairies and think they're stupid. I think that's worse because I think there's reasons, there's good reasons for this. And it's something that we study at PARC. Our, what's unique about our Climate Change Research Center is we were created to support science-based adaptation planning. So when we're working with a community, we have to understand that community. And a few years ago, <clears throat> I was contacted by a magazine in Ottawa called Policy Options. I never heard of it, but apparently all politicians read this. And they said, can you write an article about climate change adaptation on prairie farms? And I said, no, because I'm not a policy person. Well, we want to get the perspective of a scientist. I thought about it and I wrote an article saying, you got to talk to farmers. I mean, how can you possibly develop agricultural policy in Ottawa unless you find out how the farmers are being impacted and what their attitude is towards climate change. So that's, we do that type of research. We spend a lot of time talking to farmers. Here's, uh, this is in Swift Current, sitting around talking to some producers. And in the back, these aren't producers, these are PhD students, four PhD students who spent a couple summers talking to ag producers in Alberta and Saskatchewan, mostly in their kitchens. They traveled from farm to farm. And occasionally we, we brought them together and offered them pizza and brought them into Swift Current and, and other places. But they assembled a huge database of the attitude and understanding and perception of ag producers towards climate variability, drought, climate change, and so on. And this particular PhD student is now an associate professor of sociology, Dr. Amber Fletcher, and she's still using that database. And she wrote a paper published recently, Ag Producers' View of Climate Change. <clears throat> it has implications for adaptation. We have to understand the audience. And she wrote that ag producers tend to place a lot of value on personal experience. Sure, I mean, they're exposed to the weather every day and their livelihood depends on the weather. So they trust their personal experience. 
and uncertainty, a large degree of uncertainty, of course, in farming. I couldn't do it, it would drive me, drive me crazy. But there's an emphasis on natural cycles. So when you talk to producers, a lot of them say, I haven't seen any climate change. What I see is a lot of natural variability. And that's what informs their view of drought and the necessity of changing their practices in a changing climate. And Amber concludes, well, that's good. I mean, at least they're willing to adapt, but the problem is that they're, the extent to which they're willing to adapt is kind of constrained if they don't also believe in climate change. And that was their conclusion. And I helped Amber write this paper because she asked me about natural cycles. And I showed her this map. This is a map of the world, obviously. It's the variation from year to year in the climate moisture, the difference between precipitation and water loss by evapotranspiration. All those areas in brown have low variability, less than 25% from year to year. Anything that's in color has a lot of variability. And there's two places on earth where there's a large area, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Western China, sorry, Siberia, uh, yeah, Kazakhstan, in the center of Eurasia, there's a lot of natural variability from year to year, and the Northern Great Plains. So we have just about the most variable climate on earth. We share that distinction with Kazakhstan from year to year. So it's not surprising that mostly what ag producers see is natural cycles. The whiplash from too much water to too little water makes it really hard to see climate change. It's obscured. I'm almost done. Uh, I'm sure Merle will ple be pleased to know that I'm almost done. <laughs> Just another project. A few years ago, well, 2019, the province approached us, the Water Security Agency, and said, we just got a big bag of federal money to study how producers in Saskatchewan can manage climate change. So they came to Park and said, would you be willing to do the climate change part of actually three different projects? A project on drainage and uh, there's two parts of that project. One is to, to teach the ag producers about climate change, but then to teach the contractors they hire to drain their land about climate change. So that's two projects. And the third project is to getting communities to develop a drought plan and convince them that hydrological drought is a problem in Saskatchewan because of course they get their water mostly from reservoirs and creeks and so on. Okay. so. We've been working with the Water Security Agency, but we said early on, we said, okay, Doug and Heather and the people we work with there, we said, if we're gonna help producers manage climate change, first of all, we have to convince them it's occurring. And if we're gonna to try to convince producers in Saskatchewan that climate change is occurring, we have to understand why half of them don't believe it. So at that point, there was a perfect master's thesis. And who did the master's thesis? Sheena, the same woman who works in our treating lab. She switched her major from biochemistry to psychology. Amazing. But it's clinical psych, so it's still considered science. It's, it's NSERC, yeah. Um, and she, and we thought, okay. And one of the reasons we agreed to do this work for a water security agency is that, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna to speak to two and a half thousand ag producers over the next two years. Fantastic. We're gonna be hitting the road for two years and talking to two and a half thousand ag producers about climate change. And I was so excited, but you know what happened? Yeah, yeah, COVID came along. We had to switch into the credit of the water security agency. They took the entire project and they switched to a Zoom platform, which wasn't ideal. So Sheena 
had produced a survey that she was going to give, physically give, to two and a half thousand farmers and have them fill out. Well, she had to come up with an online questionnaire. And it took a while. It took two years to get the farmers to do it because they're not crazy about doing online questionnaires. They want to talk to you. They want to look you in the eye, right? Yeah, that's the other thing. The other thing, yeah. So a lot of students, especially in the social sciences, have had their research undermined by COVID. Uh, but Sheena's finally getting results, and I spoke to her, and she said, yeah, you know, we, we have this question. Over the past year, has anything happened to influence how you manage your land? Well, she wrote this question two years ago, and people responded this winter. So what did they refer to? Of course. Has anything happened over the last year? Yeah, the drought. And here's what they did. Sold the herd, produced more forages, redug the dugouts, <clears throat> changed how and when we harvest. The well went dry. The cows have to eat snow. Uh, the old ways the producer shied away from are coming back. Perhaps they realized it wasn't such a bad, it wasn't such a good idea to get rid of the shelter belts and so on. They might be referring to that. Uh, and so on and so forth. We changed crop rotations. We tried to limit disturbance. Goes on and on. A fantastic set of data. That's only a small. I mean, Sheena's survey had about 50 questions, and this was one of the questions, but it's all about the drought. Who knew when she wrote the, the survey that people would be responding with these kinds of answers? Less pasture, more crops. Reduced the fertilizer, because if you didn't get a crop, I understand that some of it is still in the soil. Um, so, take home message, talk to the producers. If you do research in Saskatchewan on weather, climate, drought, just about anything, these are the people that own most of the land in Southern Saskatchewan, most of the landscape, most of the soil, and are exposed to weather and climate. They are a great resource. And this is the message I'm going to leave you with. <clears throat> this kind of captures the message I'm trying to leave with you, that scientists are great for generating data. At Park, we have this little box to store data. It's a 96 terabyte storage device. That's how much data we have. It's data, it's meaningless. Unless it has an application. So to transfer data to information, and information to knowledge, we need some that, that context is provided by the people who need the information. In this case, the ag producers. So it's not the it's a two-way relationship. We're providing with data but they're allowing us to convert our data from data to information to knowledge. And we don't get here, probably never will get here. Wisdom is something entirely different than science. <laughs> we won't even go there. <laughs> That's it. Oh, one more information. Here's uh... oh, one more slide. One more slide. No, there we go. So there's uh, our website. And I want to introduce you to Climate West. Climate West is a new organization that Park helped create. Environment and Climate Change Canada came to us and said, would you work with a couple, work with the University of Winnipeg and with the IISD in Winnipeg and create a new agency called Climate West that allows us to disseminate and mobilize our understanding of climate change, climate variability, and drought. So check out, check out Climate West. <clears throat>
questions coming in on the chat. Dr. Murphy, you go. Hi, Les. What does the thickness in the part of IPCC say about drought in northwestern North America? Yep. Um, keep in mind, Les, of course, that they don't do research, right? The IPCC just synthesizes what we already know about the clients, science of climate change. So they cite thousands of, of papers written about climate, climate change, and they try to summarize and, and provide the take home messages. And I'm sure some of Barry's work is, is in that document. So anything you, you read in the scientific limit, literature is gonna be in the assessment report. There's not gonna be anything new in there. Sure. Yep. Yep. No. That's right. Yep. No, it doesn't say no agreement. It says low agreement. Yep. Yep. No, it doesn't say no confidence. It says low agreement. <laughs> Which is different. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it that way. And I wouldn't say. I would say low agreement. I wouldn't say no confidence, and no understanding. Yeah. That came in on the chat. Um, the first is from Steve Shirtless. If farmers and ranchers are already managing for extremely high variability in climate moisture index, why is the belief in anthropogenic climate change a prerequisite to changing their land management behavior? Isn't behavior more important than belief? That's that's a really really good question and a great way to frame it. And we don't use the term belief, right? Like I said, belief is different than, than science. And so we don't, we don't ask them or expect them to believe, uh, but we give them the science of climate change, which indicates that they are managing for the historical range of weather and water conditions. But in the future, that range is getting larger and larger. So they might be perfectly, and in fact, they're not. I mean, just the fact that we suffered during a drought indicates, the fact that we suffered during the drought of 1988 and 2001, 2002 indicates that we are not adapted to the historical range. So we can start by trying to improve our adaptation to the natural variability and then superimpose that on the effect of warming, which is to amplify the range of variability. Yeah, that the heat dome, I mean, the, the added level that yeah. yeah. There's another great question on the chat came from uh, Graham Strickler. Do you think that the extensive wetland drainage on the prairies is having an impact on summer co uh, convective activity, possibly exacerbating droughts? <laughs> hey, Graham, how's it going? I would talk to your buddies at GIWS. <laughs> but uh, what I've read, including research they've done, um, is yeah, there's there has been an impact on the climate of the prairies because of the fact that we've converted a large area of prairie ecozone into annual crop production. In fact, I read a fascinating set of uh, papers by a Canada scientist who said that summers really aren't warming on the prairies. Summer temperatures on the prairies aren't going up as much as you would expect. And they think that's due in part to the extent to which we've modified the land surface energy balance. Well, that is actually cooler. Yeah. Today, 30 year average day. Yep. Yeah. That's right, Les. Yeah, you send me that data. Yeah. Of course, it depends on which 30 years you choose, right? No, I've got you... 30 years back to 1886. Yeah. That's right. The and no. And I, we've got the same data, and it shows that um, that it's not warming to the extent that the climate models suggest. And this research. January, February, March. We don't go past January, February, March. That's why I showed you that record from Saskatoon, right? That winter temperature record. That's most of the warming. So we agree on. January, February, March. Yeah. But I cross country ski, then, and there's not enough snow. <laughs> <laughs> but getting back, getting back to Graham's question, yeah. I, you know, when you look at the extent to which we've modified 
the surface of the pre-ecozone and therefore the surface energy balance, it's not surprising that, and when we talk about anthropogenic climate change, we're not talking just about the increase in the concentration of greenhouse gases. We're also talking about deforestation and the change in the land cover because that's affecting the sequestration of carbon by plants and just the interaction between the atmosphere and the land. But why did Yellow Graph have that title? Why do you think they love the title? It makes sense. It was a huge drought. Yeah, what else? Well, the highest. We, we, we were, someone called it almost every time. Ah, right. Good point. Black and summer colors. Yeah. Well, you got that black surface, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I'm not really interesting. I should go from like the science and research part of science, considering how the science and community perspective climate. So, so where's resilience? No, there's a famous cartoon that came out just before the Copenhagen COP, I don't know, half a dozen years ago or so, the Conference of the Parties, the Copenhagen meeting, and there was a cartoon that came out with a room like this. And there's a guy like me talking about climate change. And the guy in the audience says, well, you know, what if we made cities with less, what if, what if as a result of climate change, we are forced to create cities with less pollution and they're safer and they're, there's more parks. And he was describing like the ideal city and we're being forced to create this ideal environment. So whether or not the climate is changing, uh, we're better off to change urban planning and our lifestyle. Um, and so, but it's a matter, I mean, there are these planning processes, right? Adaptation to climate change is not something new. There are these planning processes and you just have to build this climate information into those planning processes and develop urban plans and housing and transportation and lifestyles, which reduce our impact on the climate, but also improve our capacity to deal with it. And Saskatoon is doing that. More so than Regina's got, got to do some catching up. And they both have to do a lot of catching up to get to Edmonton. Edmonton has an entire climate change division within their city government. <laughs> yeah. There's, a, there's another great question, and I'll try and shout it so that people can hear it. I agree, this is from Amy Herget. I agree there is a need for more communication regarding climate change. However, there seems to be emphasis on the dialogue between producers and scientists regarding climate change impact, adaptation, and, and mitigation. And although they will be impacted, as well as our food production, producers in the end play a small role in the climate budgets. Why isn't there more focus to communicate with large businesses and major emitters to take more action? Another terrific question, and there is, in fact, at PARC, our Climate Change Research Center, we're working with an oil and gas company. Uh, we're working with um, a bank in Alberta. We have a contract with a bank in Alberta because they're really concerned that they're gonna be giving money to loaning, lo making large loans to companies that are at risk to climate change. So it's happening, but it's relatively recent. I mean, it's, it's only within, I don't know, the last three to five years that the private sector is getting really concerned about climate change and the risk they face. And the, the good news about that is they have money. They make things happen quickly. And when the private sector decides something is priority, they can make things happen uh, at a rate that's so much faster than academia or government. Like this, I came across when the bank called, they, they gave me a link to a website that has a whole set of global climate change scenarios from a whole slew of models. And that's because the banks pooled their money. There is a, there's a, um, a coalition of banks that manage 
21 trillion dollars in assets. <laughs> so they can afford to devote a little chunk of money towards the study of climate change to protect those 21 trillion dollars in assets. Yeah. Always, always look after your back end. There's okay. another one from Rex Newkirk. It says, our beliefs are subject to the circumstances as you discussed, but also by what we want to believe. How much does the lack of belief in climate change in Western Canada is tied to the understanding that our economy is closely tied to the energy sector? If there is an acceptance of climate change, will that have negative consequences for the base of the economy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's that's insightful. And yeah, if you talk to the psychologists, and I'm fortunate to be working with a psychologist, and they talk about this huge set of what are called cognitive biases, that social psychologists tell us that the way we think is not logical, that there are these ways that our thinking deviates from what's, what scientists consider logical. And that's because we've, you know, we've developed all these, these, these biases. And a famous one is confirmation bias that we all have, and we all read stuff that we believe, right? <laughs> we don't read the stuff we don't believe. It's confirmation bias. But, but you know, you're right. I mean, a few years ago, I was asked to give a talk to the board of directors of the Grain Growers of Canada. So this is a national grain growing association, and they had their annual meeting in Moose Jaw. And uh, they invited Mary and I to a barbecue on a grain farm near Moose Jaw, and I gave them a talk. And these are pretty, pretty astute ag producers, right? They're on this national board. And this young grain producer on the board came up to me afterwards and said, you know, Dave, I, I'm, I'm sure you encounter lots of resistance to these ideas of climate change. And he said, it's not that ag producers don't believe in science because our, our industry is based on science. It's, it's, he said, it's not in our best interests to admit to believing climate change. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And he said, uh, if, we, if we come out and say, yeah, scientists are right about climate change, then we have to accept the carbon tax. So they don't like what's being done in response to climate change, right? And I can't blame them, you know? Um, the stuff that's coming out of Ottawa doesn't favor prairie ag producers. So then why would they be coming out and saying, yeah, the climate is changing, we have to do something about it, when the solutions that are being offered aren't really in their favor? And I thought, wow, I really appreciated the fact that this young ag producer told me that, that it's not in our interest to admit that we believe in climate change. I hear that a lot. Of course, for those of you who don't know, I, my husband and I farm between Bigger and Rosetown, and so, and I live in a rural community. So these are the conversations that you hear all the time down at Coffee Row. Does anyone else here have a question? I'll actually bring you the microphone so that the people listening in can hear the question. I think with that, and I think we might be at the end of all of the comments. I'll just check. Yes, we are good. Thank you very much. Can I have a round of applause for Dr. Sochin? Thank you very much. Um, there was a request to send around your email. There was a few people that had to leave. They had classes at 1.30. And so they, they would like to send you an email for a follow-up. Yeah, you bet. Okay. That's why, you know. That's, food. That's super. So yep. we'll do that as well. Sorry. And thank you, and, and we have a present for oh, you. Oh, wow. <laughs> you don't get presents in Zoom. Well, yeah. Thank you so much Great, for joining us today. We really <clears throat> appreciate it. And um, I will log everything out. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. For, there were 63 people online. So thank you for being the anchor here in person for someone <laughs> to talk to. And thank you everyone online for tuning in. This has been recorded and we will post it on the Undergraduate Research Initiative website and send you all a link. Thank you all so much. Where are you? Can you capture, capture or save the chat somehow? Okay, I, I wouldn't mind having some of those questions. They were good questions. I should have brought some water because I- I was thinking the same thing. I meant to bring I, some water.